the visual landscape of New England changes dramatically during winter. Hard to believe that just about a week and a half ago, there was about three feet of snow on the ground right here. January thaw, and it's all gone. Regardless, whenever a group of folks gather around and it's winter, one topic of discussion is bound to be, well, which was the worst winter? I had a friend of mine tell me that uh, he had a winter that was so cold that his septic system froze up solid. That is cold. My candidate for the snowiest winter is, a, is the winter of 1948. Now the wind howled and the snow came down and my mom went into labor. And so my dad went through the arduous task of getting her ready to go to the hospital, which meant putting on the snow chains, getting the tires dug out, and then driving over to the snowy hillside to the hospital. And it ended up being false labor. Well, during the month of January during 48, that happened a number of times. So my folks were real happy when I finally decided to come out and visit everybody and join folks on this planet. Now, how do I know this? I wasn't even born yet. Well, the answer to that question is the subject of our show today, and that is story, family stories, that oral tradition that connects us today with our forebears and the events of the past. It's an important part of our history. Villages, clans, tribes have always communicated orally. Most of our music comes from this oral tradition. It's a very important way for us to learn who we are and how we fit in. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, and we're going to investigate the voices of the village, the voices of the elders who help us understand who we are as a people. And we're going to learn about some stories, we're going to learn why it's important to preserve them, and we're also going to learn how you actually do it. So I tell you what, make yourself real comfortable and lend me an ear. You know, there was a time when snow in winter was a real blessing here in New England. It allowed us to travel to places that normally we couldn't get to, at least not very easily. Because you see, we had horse-drawn sleighs. And actually, they never even bothered to plow the roads. They had these big, large oaken rollers they used to pull behind the wagons that would pat the road down and even break it up and make it a little easier to travel on. Now, how do we know this? Well, family stories. The passing along of seasonal information and traditions within the family is very important. And we're fortunate enough today to have two people who are willing to share some of their fondest memories with us. Mrs. Virginia Farrell Holtz of Fisherville in South Grafton, and Mr. Charles Marble of Millbury. They have some great stories that they want to share with us. So let's listen. I was thinking when we were kids, actually the mill influenced the way we played. Because I remember we used to go, of course, a lot of the kids I knew, their parents worked in the mill. And at noontime, we used to go into the mill. We weren't supposed to be there, but we did anyway. And we used to get bobbins that were f f all full of yarn. And we used to make baseballs out of them because they didn't want us to have baseballs in the schoolyard because we broke too many windows. <laughs> so the yarn, they were soft, you know. So we used to use those. They were pretty colorful, some of them. I used to get out of work at 24, and I'd go home and start ironing, because we, I was the oldest of eight. So my mother would put out the wash on Monday, take it all in, and I'd start ironing from 24 until 12 o'clock, Mondays and Tuesdays. And Wednesday, I'd go dancing at the Polish hall. <laughs> right below the uh, school, there was a pond. And of course, they, they used the, the brook and the pond as a way of getting rid of all their junk when they dyed the wool. Some days you'd go down there and the pond would be purple. Next day, yellow or red. You never knew what it was going to be. And it didn't smell too good, I can tell you that. But I think of how they polluted that river and that brook. It was just awful. And at night, you could hear those looms from miles away. 
What, quite a clatter, huh? Oh, it, it made a clatter. I had an, an uncle who was foreman there. Every time I had to go down to on an errand for Uncle Jack, he'd say, shh, you don't have to yell. And I would be yelling, because I couldn't hear. But when I was a kid, we had a horse and a wagon. And my father finally managed to get himself a mortal tea. He bought it from a, a, a man that was going overseas. It was a 1914 Ford. And he went up to the city to buy it and get it. And he didn't know how to drive. So the guy gave him about a 10 minute lesson on how to drive. And he came home with it. And he, I remember him telling my mother that when he got down by the wire mill, he looked at the speedometer and he discovered he was going 18 miles an hour. He figured he'd better slow down. <laughs> Like I said, they'd have a minstrel show once a year. Several people would meet, you know, at minstrel shows that they wouldn't meet otherwise. And um, uh, there was one man I recall who had reddish hair. And he came out one time dressed as a woman. He had a red wig on. And he had a beautiful voice. He had a beautiful tenor voice. But he could go way up high. And he sang just like a woman. Nobody knew who he was. They would pull these little stunts, and of course, they'd always try to get the community involved. Now, my mother had eight children, and one of the jokes was about her. She got on a bus, and the bus driver said, is this a picnic? She says, you have eight kids, and it ain't no picnic. <laughs> Things like that, you know. Fascinating stories, eh? Real stories by real people about real life. But besides being interesting, what other reasons do we have for supporting and maintaining the oral tradition of family storytelling? Well, let's catch up with folklorist Michael Bell and find out. Besides, we just might find out what a folklorist really does. We're with Michael Bell, and we're sitting here in the old Rhode Island State House, where the state legislature used to meet, and it was a state district court not too long ago, a place full of traditions. I think it's a good place, Michael, to talk a little bit about traditions and family storytelling. Um, but first, what is a folklorist and what does he do? Well, a folklorist is really interested in studying traditional culture, uh, particularly cultural expressions that have been passed down from one generation to the next informally, you know, not part of any kind of formal or official uh, organization or culture, but just the things that have been learned by listening by looking at what you see going on around you and imitating those things. It's almost, I wouldn't say it's unconscious or subconscious, but it's out of our awareness most of the time that we have this great wealth of traditional culture. Now, how does this get passed along from family to family? Well, it, mainly it's the things that one person in the family thinks are important enough to tell a younger generation. So they can be stories about people in the family events that happen to the family, and on a wider scope in the community, too. So folklore tends to be local and confined to uh, small groups, whether they're families or neighborhoods or ethnic groups or religious groups or occupational groups. All of these small groups have their own uh, folklore that they transmit from one generation to the next. In Grafton Center, they used to call us mill rats or something like that. But it, really, we had nice jobs. And uh, they were really preferential to working in the things that they worked in sometimes. They worked in, at, in the thread mill in North Grafton, which is, uh, I always thought it was kind of a dumpy place, but <laughs> probably it was the sections of the was town. Oh, yes, there, there always was, especially between Grafton Center and the, and the South End. They always felt that we weren't quite up to them in culture and everything. The folklore generally defines kind of the background for, for doing what we do in those groups. For example, uh, fishermen who go out from the ports here on the East Coast, uh, they learn, mainly they learn the trade and the, and the occupation by going out and, and doing it. 
by watching what other fishermen do and listening to what they say, keeping their mouth shut and trying to fit in. And that's the folk process, really, kind of imitating what you see, listening to what you hear, and then trying to put that into practice. Uh, they don't learn to be fishermen, usually by going to some sort of a school or junior college. It's on the job training. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the importance of folklore. And, and it's the same as in a family. You learn how to fit into the family. You learn the values, the attitudes, the beliefs of your own family uh, by participating in that process of the oral tradition and the imitation of the customary examples you see around you. You, know, you learn how to celebrate a birthday because you become part of a birthday celebration. You know, at the age of one, you have your first birthday. You might not remember it, but each year that gets repeated in, in pretty much the same way. So then you start to learn, well, this is the way birthdays are celebrated. Well, as I remember Christmas as a kid, it, it was rather sparse. We, we usually got one thing that we wanted and a lot of other things like slippers and bathrobes we didn't want. When I look at the amount of presents the kids get today, I'm amazed, I mean. The opportunities aren't as plentiful as they used to be. The opportunities for everybody who's in, in a family to get together and to share these important expressions that have been inherited, so to speak. And, and I think also with mass media, which has kind of separated people, so the kids have their own popular culture that they're interested in, and they get that through television, CDs, interacting with other kids their age. And so I think you're right, there's probably less time spent uh, cross-generational within families or even in communities. It, it may seem cold to talk about people as if they were, you know, quarks or <laughs> scientific phenomena that you're looking at, but in a way you have to do that as a folklorist or an anthropologist or an ethnographer. You have to kind of stand back from what you're looking at. And you make judgments, but you try to let those judgments not influence how you interpret what you see. Not all folklore is, is quaint, beautiful, charming. You know, some folklore is nasty. We have ethnic slurs. We have ethnic jokes and racial jokes, gender jokes, and jokes about people's sexual preferences. I mean, this is all part of our folklore. You know, I collect it, I document it, I interpret it. I don't necessarily have to endorse it or like it. So it's it's not necessary that everything that's part of our folklore be preserved. Maybe we want to eradicate some things in our traditional culture. I tell you, a great entree into family folklore would be any visual artifacts you have. They can be like photo albums are wonderful because there are people and they're usually photographs are taken during special events. You know, in most cases, unless you have someone who's really into photography, you don't just take photographs periodically. It's when the family gets together, when there's a special occasion, a graduation, a wedding, you know, a Thanksgiving or a Christmas or a Hanukkah or something, you take photographs. And so those are good occasions for stimulating people's memories. So if you sit down with a photo album and the people in the family who are, say, old enough to remember uh, those events, then you can start eliciting some of the stories and you go from there. The stories provide concrete examples of, of what we are, who we are, how to behave, what to expect. And they're concrete in the sense that they're, they're people with real people that have names. The events are real in the sense that the places are located and we know where they are. And their truth may be debatable, but we act on the belief, so that's what's important. And I, I had a good example. One woman brought in something from the Civil War and she said, in my family, from the Civil War on, all the men felt it was their f obligation to serve in whatever war we happened to be in at the time. So, because I had this ancestor who in the Civil War served and, and got this medal. But she said, I started doing some genealogy and I found out that in actuality, he didn't serve in the war. He paid someone to take his place, which, which you could do at that time. He was drafted and he paid someone to take his place. But this story was started and it influenced subsequent generations to, to join the, uh, the armed forces and to serve, even though it wasn't true. So <laughs> for me, you know, that shows the power of folklore mm. that, and the power of belief. If you believe it and you act on it, in a sense, that's the important thing. 
And as a folklorist, I'm interested in what people believe and how they act on those beliefs. When I was a kid, Memorial Day was a big deal, you know, especially Civil War people. And most of the kids I knew, their grandfathers were veterans, and I didn't have one, and that used to bother me. I couldn't brag about my grandfather being in the Civil War. We were around here when they brought the first people up to unionize the mills. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. How was we that? were scared stiff. That was would have been 1938, probably. And we were scared stiff. We really were, you know, because here were these big trucks carrying loads of men handing out cards for you to give out, and we didn't know what was going to happen. What was your feeling about unionization? Well, I didn't like it. My father did. He said it was the, the future of the industry. I said it was the end of the industry, so I don't know what you can take your, your pick. I think I would kind of take stock, mentally at least, of who's in the family and how accessible they are. And I would prioritize who I wanted to talk to first on the basis of who's most frail, really, I mean, to put it that way. That uh, it's important to get, to get these um, memories on tape, especially videotape, audio tape, you know, preserved that way. And, uh, and you start with the people that, if you put it off too long, may not be around in, in two or three months or next year. From there, I mean, you don't have to, like, if you talk to, to Aunt Martha, you know, once on tape, that doesn't mean you can't go back again. And even if there's some redundancy telling the same thing over and over, that in itself is important information, I think. So I wouldn't be afraid to go out more than once to the same person and, and interview the person. And do it in short segments, you know. Two hours is plenty for anybody. After that, even the hardiest of person gets kind of weary of the whole process. I was doing some field work for a project with the uh, Rhode Island Black Heritage Society. And we were interviewing some of the older African Americans in, in the community. And we finally got to the oldest woman in the state, who was some years over 100 years old. Okay, and she was, so she had no peers. No one could tell this woman how to behave. And she couldn't look around and say, well, this is what I'm supposed to do at 106, because there was no one else of that age. So she pretty much ran the, uh, the senior center where she lived. The interview went on. It was OK. I was getting some interesting information, because her father was a bake master who uh, put together clam bakes and was supposedly one of the best around. So this would have been you know, well over 100 years ago. So it was good information. And I kept asking her questions, which, of course, we do as folklorists. And then she stopped partway through the interview and looked at me and says, oh, don't you know anything? Why are you asking me all these questions? <laughs> Which to me reinforced the role that I have as a folklorist. It's kind of, a, it's kind of an ambiguous role. I mean, first of all, I'm coming to people as an expert in the field because I know a lot about folklore in general. I've done a lot of investigating myself and field work and interpretation and reading and research. But the people I'm talking to know more, a lot more than I do about their own folklore. So in a sense, they're the experts in that field, and that's where I get my information. So it, it's constantly a humbling experience when you think you know quite a bit, but you go somewhere and then someone says, why don't you know anything? <laughs> this is the first thing you learned was burling. And you pick the knots and you'd push it through to the wrong side of the cloth. This would go down to the dyers, and was sheared off, all the knots were sheared off, and dyed. The things you used to do were incredible. If there was a coarse thread that didn't look right, you used to take these, put it through a thread, get a piece of good thread, and pull it through, and you'd pull it through 15 yards at a time. And this was all done by hand? All done by hand. Now, how long did it take to learn that particular skill? It took at least two years, at least two, most likely three or four. It would be even better. Because sometimes there was what they would call a smash. That's when a lot of threads had broken at once. And this was the most delicate thing to weave back together by hand, you know. Those were 
used to get paid quite a lot for that because it was really expert hand weaving. And here we are at Slater Mill, where it all began, the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution, and also the Rhode Island system of manufacturing, where mill villages became the major characteristic of the Blackstone Valley. Generations of mill workers worked here at the various mills, and we thought it appropriate that we track down Ranger Suzanne Buchanan for a Blackstone moment, for she is a fourth generation mill worker. And we thought it appropriate because she can tell us why her family stories are so important and why they should be preserved. Hi, this is Ranger Suzanne Buchanan bringing you a Blackstone moment. I'm here at Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, my hometown, for I'm the fourth generation to work the mills of the Blackstone Valley, but today I'm working the mills as a tour guide and not as a hard laborer. I often ask myself, what would my past generations think if they knew that their great-granddaughter and granddaughter had a job that allowed them to talk about the jobs of the past. I can't imagine what they'd think, but it gives me great pride to be able to instill the heritage here in the Blackstone Valley. Quite often my grandmother who worked the mills would tell me they hated the job. I mean it was a job, you know, that they just did that, um, you know, to say they liked the job, they, I mean, they liked the people they worked with, they liked going to work, there was that camaraderie of being together, but to say um, they loved their job, it was noisy, it was smelly, um, it was a dirty job that they had to do, but that job did create pride because they were f creating a finished product that was known throughout the whole country for the Blackstone Valley was known to be the leaders in textile here. I often wonder, I go by a, a sitting factory that's abandoned and lonely and I say, oh, if that mill could just talk for five minutes and tell me a good story, I'm sure it would fill my ears. This has been Ranger Suzanne Buchanan bringing you a Blackstone moment and inviting you to come out and explore the heritage and the pride that we offer in the Blackstone Valley. Gathering family histories isn't as easy as it seems. For example, I may want to learn about the still that my great-grandfather ran back in the woods, but my grandmother wants to tell me about the special holiday tablecloth her mother used to set out and the special seating arrangements used to be made during the holiday seasons. Because you see, my uncle Alfred had this horrible smelling cigar and he had to be as far away from Aunt Lil as possible. I guess the point is that people are going to want to tell you the stories that are important to them and then if you're patient enough, they'll tell you the stories that you really want to hear. So you see, there are some techniques that we can learn to make family storytelling sessions rewarding. Now to learn about the nuts and bolts of family storytelling and gathering a family history, let's catch up with Rebecca Joseph. She's a senior ethnographer from the National Park Service, and let's pick her brain. I think that um, probably the most basic things that you need um, are a pad and a, and a good pen because you need to keep track of what you're doing. It's very important to be well organized because what you find is that the material that you're collecting adds up very quickly and you need to be able to keep track of your activities, who you've talked to, when, where, and about what topics. And you also need some means of recording the conversations or the interviews that you're having with family members and that can be done by hand. It can be done by tape recorder. It can be done by camcorder and which way you will choose to do that in any given interview really depends on what are the materials that you have available to you, um, what is the comfort level of the person that you're interviewing um, with different kinds of technology. One of the very fun things that you can do is to take your camcorder and go out on your own or go out with a family member or two and videotape places of importance to your family, where your parents were married, where your great-grandparents worked, um, where you went to elementary school, and any places, places where family reunions were held. Perhaps there's an area where you had an annual, and may continue to have an annual picnic. And some of those areas may look very much as they have in the past, and some of them may look very different. But you can stand uh, with the camcorder and either you can give narration or another individual can give narration of these places. And that makes a very nice document um, for the family as a whole, but also that can be passed on 
to another generation. It's important to set up ahead of time with the person that you're going to be interviewing um, where is a comfortable location. One of the biggest problems that we run into with interviews um, that are done on an informal basis is background noise. The television is on, the radio is on, the dishwasher is running. The Some consideration for, for the location, um, distractions and background noise is also um, a good idea to make sure, especially if you're tape recording or um, you're recording on video that you don't have a lot of background noise and other kinds of, of distractions that will make it hard later on to understand what was said. Doing family histories and particularly doing oral histories requires a lot of patience. And what you will find, um, particularly with older family members who have many, many years of experience and many stories, is that people need to tell their stories in their own time and in their own way. And eventually they may come around to what you want to know and they may not, but what they've talked about in the meantime may take you into some other very interesting directions. I think the other thing that, that often happens is that different people will tell you different versions of the same story. Because everyone experiences an event somewhat differently based on the personal experiences that they bring to that, even if they're in the same family. And you may find that you have um, two or three or even 12 different versions of the same story, all of which are true from the perspective of the person who's telling them to you. And then um, what you need to do as, as the person who's compiling the history and together with your, with your family is to decide how you want to handle that. So it really is a discovery trip, isn't it? Yes, it really is. And I think that it's quite a wonderful thing to do because I think that we're living in a time and place where families don't live for the most part, uh, multiple generations of families in close proximity to each other anymore. And I think that all of us um, need to feel a sense of connection to our past and to understand who we are today and who we would like to be and what kinds of experiences we would like our, our children and our grandchildren to have in the future. And doing family history provides us with an opportunity to do that. Families preserve their history using many different techniques. Now we're here at Waters Farm in Sutton, Massachusetts, and the reason why this farm is important is back in 1757, the first generation of Waters sat down and began a diary. And 200 years later, after each generation had added their thoughts and their stories, we have 200 years of wonderful family stories about life on a farm. And it's one reason why this farm is still preserved today. But these remembrances are very fragile. Matter of fact, we learn just how fragile they really are in filming of this show. Mrs. Virginia Farrell Holtz, who we interviewed, passed away just three weeks after we talked with her. We had no idea that she was so ill with leukemia. The woman that we talked to was a very vibrant, cheery woman who had a quick smile and a great laugh and told us of the stories of her family, her love for dancing, her work in the mills. And she shared these very important memories with us, and we were very privileged to share them. I'm Chuck Arning. I'm a ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And we want to tell you a little bit about how important family stories are, the oral tradition as we pass our wisdom down from old to young. And I do want to remind you that the next time you have a dining room table setting and everybody's there, or people are hanging around the wood stove or helping mom in the kitchen, those family stories you tell, listen, for they are singing America.